the Got Questions series. We'll continue that this week. And where all this came from was a big website called gotquestions.org answered a question about us, and it ended with we're all unbiblical, misunderstanding scripture twisters. So one of the folks here in our assembly asked if I'd address these things, and we're moving along through that. And first, we, I, need to, I have a call from the accuracy department. I have to address a few things. Last week, I said Leviticus when I was describing the book Leviticus. I do that because I think it's funny, <laughs> but I guess I did it in such a deadpan way that the person was concerned that people may think that I don't know how to pronounce the book of Leviticus. <laughs> I do, but I like calling it Leviticus. The second thing I got yelled at for last week is I called myself a dummy during the lesson. And at the end, I said, you are not a dummy. <laughs> I understand that. I'm a man of average intellect. I'm not a dummy. But uh, I actually blame you all because you couldn't hear my thoughts. What I was thinking, I was making a point. I don't even remember what the point I was making. But I was thinking about all the thousands of years of great minds and theologians and all the Christians and their ivory towers who spend all their life studying. And they, they didn't see the truth of Paul, but just some normal person like me saw it. And that, that's what I was thinking about when I said that. So, one other, or two other things. There is a video on our website called Where to Start. It was a message I did about eight months ago. And at the 51 minute mark, I was talking about the book of Romans. And instead of saying Romans 9 through 11, I said Hebrews 9 through 11. So, I'm wondering why none of you all caught it. And then I remembered it's the 51 minute mark. <laughs> Anything after 45, nobody hears. That's what my wife tells me. So. <laughs> and finally, I, I said last week that I, I was telling you all how I, with the, the people who are asking disingenuous, hateful questions, I, I was not going to answer them. And I decided to change my policy. I thought that was a bit rude. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to give them a very simple answer. Usually the, the question starts something like, can you explain why, and then blah, 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 blah. Do you understand that? Blah, 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 blah. Very hateful disingenuous. So now I'm just going to answer them with yes. Can you answer the question about blah, 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 blah? Yes. Because anything after that, they don't want to hear anyway. So that saves me time. I'll just say yes. So moving along this week, I've got all this on the board. I've got our Spanish lingo here. Reasons Acts 2 is Nacho Church's birthday. Not your for those who may, around the world, that may not get the, uh, the English reference. We're dealing with these points. And so far in this series, we've studied that the day of Pentecost is a Jewish feast day prescribed under the law. So to look for that, for the mystery church, the body of Christ, and to go back under the law of Moses and observe a feast day, we talked about the body of Christ's relation to feast days and the law and Sabbaths and that kind of thing. Second reason is, and we're not under the law, Romans 6.14, we're under grace. Second reason was Peter's talking to Jews. How do we know that? Because we can read our English Bible and believe it. Ye men of Israel, all the house of Israel, and those that dwell at Jerusalem. Um, and we know that Peter, as late as Acts 10, was talking to only Jews. The third reason we have is, we saw at the end of Acts 2 where everyone sold all their stuff and had a commune. And no Pentecostal church, nobody who thinks that Acts 2 is the church's birthday does that. Interesting. Strange that the richest pastors <laughs> are the, the ones with the most biggest pile of personal wealth are the people who say Acts 2 is the birthday of their church. And they should be the first ones selling all their stuff. But they don't. Um, Acts 4, or number, point number 4, we saw that the Acts 2 church was already in existence before Acts 2. So it wasn't the birthday of anything, any church. Small point here, number 5. Was that a small point? Peter did not preach the gospel that saves your soul and my soul in Acts 2. 
And I, I want to I want to hit this because I, I don't think I said it as clearly as I wanted to when we did the first lesson. Death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is our gospel, correct? We trust that completed work. Peter, in Acts 2, said that was the bad news. Is that different? <laughs> that's kind of a big deal. And, well, that's what, the only reason a good news makes sense is if you know the bad news. And Peter's gospel to them, the, the cure to the bad news was go back and do what John the Baptist said, repent and get water baptized. Paul preaches the death, burial, and resurrection as the good news. A student of the Bible should notice that. I say that having spent two and a half decades of my life never noticing that. <laughs> Got the t-shirt on that. But that's, that's a big deal. Our, Paul's bad news is Romans 3.23. All y'all are equally worthless. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I've got this gospel of grace for you. And reason number six here, we looked at Acts 3.21 and Romans 16.25. We looked at the last words in those verses. Since the world began. Peter says, I'm preaching the Christ the same way all the prophets through all the world have preached him since the world began. Paul says, I'm preaching Christ according to a mystery that no one knew since the world began. So that's where we're at. We've been going through these verses. They're showing that everything going on here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Acts, everything is prophecy. It's moving through Israel's prophetic timeline. It's fulfilling this prophecy about that. And it's all about Israel. And it's all about Israel's kingdom and the earthly program and all that culmination of the plan that God uh, originally told Abraham about. So since I can't stop touching touchy subjects. <laughs> We're going to hit a touchy one this week. Let's add number seven. Well, it's point number seven, so this has got to be sanctified, right? Sure. If you know Bible numbers. If Acts 2 is the birthday of the church, the body of Christ, why is there the wrong baptism in Acts 2? I just heard the clicks. Thousands of people online just clicked me off. <laughs> Click. We're done. Baptism. The baptism going on in Acts 2, there's actually two baptisms in Acts 2 spoken of. You didn't know there was more than one, did you? Because as soon as I say the word baptism, you think water. I say baptism, you think water, water, baptism, baptism, water. I got the same problem in my head. The Bible is fixing that for me. Did you know there's something like more than a dozen different baptisms in the Bible? And I know this is old hat for some of you guys, but I want to I hit on this because, like we said earlier, there's a lot of new people on board watching online. So I want to hit this baptism thing. And you want to start a fight with Christian people? You want to have blood sports with your good Christian brethren and sistren? Just start a conversation about baptism. Or start a conversation about baptism and combine it with the Holy Ghost. You can start a fight real quick. That's why I say it's a touchy subject. So I'm going to touch it. We're going <laughs> to... It kind of is. The baptism in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, was that a mystery? It was a fulfillment of prophecy. The promise of the Father that he gave to Israel. And I mentioned last week, I think, that it's almost like everything Jesus is doing is just fulfilling these prophecies that God had made to Israel through the centuries. And it's almost like Romans 15, 8 says, now... 
I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made to the fathers. That's what he was doing. The mystery church hadn't started yet. So what I want to do, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew. There is one single verse in your Bible that has one, two, three different baptisms in it. Do you know that? It's in Matthew chapter 3. Now, I'm not starting a game of tic-tac-toe here. You'll see in a second. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist, uh, he started his ministry. Look at verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Let's count them. There's one. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. There's two. And with fire. Has anybody ever seen the video of Benny Hinn calling the fire down on his preachers? The Pentecostals think the fire baptism is a good thing. They think it's the fire of the Spirit in you. Look at the next verse. The next verse tells you what the fire is about. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Is that a good thing? You don't want the fire baptism, do you? Amen. So in this verse, we have three different baptisms. So what I'm going to do, this is how it was taught to me and helped me tremendously, so I'm going to share it with you. So the first baptizer is John, isn't it? He's the one talking. He's baptizing people into H2O with the result of them repenting and being baptized as Israel and receiving their Messiah. Correct? Okay. The next baptizer is Christ. And John foretells that he will baptize with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Result on that, we'll get to in a minute. The third baptism is also Christ, fire, with the result, everlasting destruction, correct? So you started thinking, every time you think baptism, it's water. I've just shown you two that weren't. Christ called his death a baptism. It says, I have a baptism to be baptized with. How am I straightened until it be accomplished? Now, looking at what happened at Pentecost, it's a fulfillment of many prophecies. And from prophets, most notably, John the Baptist just said it. And Christ said it as well. In Acts 1, if you still have the book of Acts... My mental, that's Matthew 3.11, by the way, is where you remember that. The way I remember that mentally, I have a bunch of little different tricks in my brain, but when I was in high school, there was a band that the name of the band was 3.11. So all I have to remember is Matthew and that band. Remember Matthew 3.11. It's easy. Yeah. I'm sure you listen to quite a bit of their music. Exactly. <laughs> But in Acts 1 and verse 4, this is Jesus talking again. He says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So Jesus is telling them, 
You did this, this is coming. Baptism 2.0. Now, according to Matthew 3.11, Jesus is the baptizer, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be baptizing with the Holy Ghost. I know it seems like I'm repeating, repeating myself over and over again, but there'll be a point to this. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, what's a member of it, Old Testament Israel and John 14 going to think? Been trying. <laughs> We've been trying since Exodus 19. Everything that thou said will do. How's that been working out for you? If you love me, keep my commandments. How, oh, Lord? The next thing Christ says is, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. The promise of God's Holy Spirit in doing Israel with the ability to keep the law. It's the same thing Jeremiah prophesied about in Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36. This prophecy of the God's Holy Spirit coming in them and they wake up in the morning and actually love their neighbor as themselves. None of you right now love your neighbor as yourself. I know that. Because I don't. You try. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Really? You just lied. That means you're disobeying one of the other commandments. But that's the promise that God gives Israel. And they'll be able to keep the law, have communism work, and make it through their tribulation and great tribulation into their kingdom and endure to the end. That's the promise to Israel that's going on through all this. And by the way, look what we found here. A dry baptism. I say baptism, you think water. There's no water there. So we've got all that information in our frontal lobes here. Here's the rub. Houston, we have a problem. If Acts 2, if my statement up here on the top, reasons Acts 2 is not your church's birthday, if I'm wrong and Acts 2 is the church's birthday, we have a problem. Let's read the verse. Acts 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Here the baptism comes. And what did they do? They began to fall down on the floor, dance up and down the aisles, wave their hands at the light fixtures. Uh-uh. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Suddenly I can speak a new language. Look at verse 6. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. A bunch of simple Jewish men from Galilee, and here comes a guy in from Persia, and he's watching this Jewish man, he's pretty sure has never left this country, how am I hearing perfect Persian in the exact dialect of my hometown? Whoa. Somebody comes in from Africa and speaking an African tongue. Here's this simple Jewish fisherman speaking my home. And I know we've talked about this. There's English. There's British English. There's Southern America English. There's all different kinds of English. You're hearing it in your exact dialect from the town you were born. And that happens where? Which church should we go to that happens? Now think about this. We live in a country of 350 million people. There are millions and millions and millions of people who think Acts 2 is their pattern for the church. There are millions and millions of people who think that they can speak in new tongues. How come not one 
drives in the car up to New York City, goes to John F. Kennedy International Airport to the International Terminal, where thousands of people from hundreds of countries come in every single day. How come not one of them goes up into that terminal and speaks to all of them, and they hear it in their perfectly in their home dialect? You ever heard of that happening? I checked the news this week. didn't happen this week. Or the week before, or the week before, or the week before. That's what's going on in Acts 2. If Acts 2 is the birthday for your church, there should be somebody up in that terminal every single day, shouldn't there? Preaching the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel and then hearing it in their own dialect, in their own perfect language. So, interesting point. Just wanted to make that picky picky, right? I said here it's the wrong baptism. Okay? So all this has to do with prophecy. The baptism for the church, the body of Christ, who knows what that baptism is? Who's the one baptizing? Right. So let's extend our tic-tac-toe down a little bit. Do you have 1 Corinthians 12? Turn to that, please. 1 Corinthians 12. Probably not. <laughs> First Corinthians twelve thirteen. First Corinthians twelve thirteen. Who's the baptizer? For by one spirit. The last one, Jesus was baptizing with the Holy Ghost. Now, our baptism, the Holy Ghost is the baptizer. Bet you never noticed that before either. Again, I spent two and a half decades of my life never noticing that. It's the wrong baptizer to start with. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink in one spirit, one body. What's the one body? You've heard me say the church, the body of Christ 30 times. I know. How did I get an idea like that? Now, well, Galatians 3.27, for as many as of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. One body of Christ. Colossians 2.11 In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, no blood circumcision, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. Is that wet? God the Holy Spirit. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of the priest in waiters. That's not what your Bible says? Well, I watched the Duck Dynasty guys. He said he baptized you into Christ when he put the guy down in the hot tub. That's not the operation of God, is it? Sorry, Uncle Phil or Uncle Si, whatever their names are. The God, the Holy Spirit, baptizes me into the body of Christ. There's not a drop of water there. We're in also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So there's now, how many baptisms do we have on the board? Four. Three of them are not water. This is when you need to tell yourself... Don't think water every time I hear the word baptism. 
What's the purpose of Christ baptizing us into the body of Christ? The salvation of your eternal soul? Is that a big enough deal to you? Yeah. That's when somebody tells you you got to be baptized in order to be saved. You say, Amen. I need this baptism to be saved. I need this dry baptism of God the Holy Spirit baptizing me into the body of Christ when I put my faith in Christ's completed work. Yes, I need that baptism. Now, what do you want to say about water? Uh. <laughs> That's different, isn't it? That is backwards. Oh, I already put the reason for Israel's baptism. Their New Testament, keeping the law. Enduring to the end. So we've got now, with this little game of tic-tac-toe, we've got four different baptisms, four different elements, four different reasons for the baptism, and three different baptizers. They're different. It's God doing different things for different reasons for different people to achieve different purposes. It's almost like Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God in sundry times and diverse manners spake. He's got different things going on. So for us to come to one page of our Bible, rip it completely out of its context, and make it something that it isn't because we like it and our church has a doctrine built on it, would be wrong. Yes. <laughs> wrong. The spirit baptism at Pentecost endues that little flock of Israel, like I said, to keep the law, keep the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, endure to the end, just as Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 say. Today, our baptizer is God the Holy Ghost. When we hear Peter's bad news, which is our good news, the death, the burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we trust that, God the Holy Spirit baptizes us into that one body of Christ and saves us and seals us. Amen. What about the law? Are we related to that? You have Colossians. Turn to Colossians 2. Colossians 2 and verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. Did anybody think water just now? Don't think water. Colossians 2.12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Does that mean you brought anything to the transaction? I bring death, uncircumcision, and sin, Lord. What do you give me for that? Grace. Mercy. Peace. But I don't want anything you're bringing to the table. I brought everything you need to the table. Dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you. Let's say it together. A-L-L. -L. All trespasses. How many of your trespasses were committed when, you, when this verse was written? In your life. You hadn't even got started yet, did you? So every one of your sins was yet and still future when this verse was written. He's forgiven you all based on what Christ did. What about the law? Look at verse 14. 
blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. You're not under the law, you're under grace. And this is what, and I say this especially for the new people that have come on and are watching these videos. Old Testament Israel, Israel, let me say this clearly, Israel is always associated with the law. Whether they be Old Testament or New Testament. Old Testament, they were liars. Everything he says will do. New Testament Israel, when they have God's Holy Spirit in them, they actually do it. But either way, Old Testament Israel is associated with the law, the same as New Testament. We, the church, the body of Christ, are never associated with the law after it serves its schoolmaster function. Right? It identifies sin. It shows us how sinful we are. We trust Christ's payment for it. After that, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We have no need of it. Amen. We are in Christ. You are not under the law. You are under grace. Is that different? People think the law, they think the Ten Commandments. That's the starter pack, folks. There are 613 points of law in Israel's law. Is anyone in here wearing blended garments? Did anybody see cotton polyester mix on your tag when you put your shirt on this morning? That is a violation of the law of Moses. What's that? <laughs> Did anyone eat rabbit? Bacon? Violation of the law of Moses. We, the church, the body of Christ, are not under law, under grace. He's blotted out the handwriting of ordinances. The very first thing we talked about, Pentecost is a Jewish feast day prescribed by the law of Moses. Our apostle tells us in Colossians 2.16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day. Well, there's the law, folks, isn't it? What's the law all about? Meat, drink, respect of a holy day. Quite a few points. Or of the new moon, or of Sabbath days. Is there a commandment in there about Sabbath days? Verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but, you see how a shadow? of things to come, and then the disjunctive conjunction, but. But the body is of Christ. But the body is not the shadow or the things to come. It's something different. You are in the but now. But the body is of Christ. You are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6.14 says. Now I have more reasons but as we move along, I thought that was enough listing things out for one week. I don't want to make people's eyes start to roll in the back of their head. But that's quite a few good reasons to say, you know what, I don't think X2 is my church. I don't think that church there is my church. It's not your church. If anybody, actually, I haven't seen one of these sitting around in a while. Does anybody have a printout still of the answer from gotquestions.org? I'm going to give out an award today to the writer of the Got Questions article. It is called the Bonehead or Liar Award. I can't tell which because I don't know the person, but I can judge the words and say, well, whoever wrote this doesn't really know what they're talking about, or they're just, they do know and they're just lying about it. So I will be handing out the Bonehead or Liar Award. This paragraph here. It is one, two, third paragraph in their answer. It says, according to mid-Acts dispensationalism or the grace movement, that's us, the apostles Peter, James, and John and the rest were still operating under the old covenant in Acts 1 to 8. They were still dutifully keeping the law and still meeting as a Jewish body in Jerusalem Peter and the other apostles preached repentance to Israel, but there was no church till Paul. That's the words and the way the article was written. 
envelope, please. And the Bonehead or Liar Award goes to whoever wrote that. This is, what, the fifth? I think this is the fifth lesson in this series. Has anyone heard me say that the apostles are still in the Old Testament in Acts 1 through 8? Anybody heard me say anything like that? Has anyone heard me say that Israel can't get their new covenant until the death of the testator and quote Hebrews 9? So I clearly put a line at the cross, old covenant before for Israel, new covenant after, correct? I saw a couple of nods, remember? Okay. Has anybody heard me say there was no church until Paul? Didn't we just talk about, oh, I don't know, 30 minutes ago, that there was a church in existence before Acts 2? So when somebody comes along and says that I say there's no church until Paul, you can see how that would mildly annoy me. Okay? How could the august website of gotquestions.org, which has answered more than a half of a million questions, say such a thing? Bonehead or liar? That's the choices. Now, liar would mean that somebody purposely, knowledgeably told an untruth about what we believe. Why would somebody do that? Well, you see it in politics all the time. You can't handle the argument of the other side. You tell lies about the other side, don't you? You attack and tell lies because you can't handle the facts. Now, doctrinally, that is true. When you study these verses, the verses that are undeniable, when you let the verses say what they say and mean what they mean. So, in truth, that is true. We are a threat. But practically, I guarantee you the guy who wrote that never heard of us before somebody asked that question. We're so small, there's so few people like us, that we're not even on their radar. So that tells me I'm going to lean towards Bonehead. Bonehead or Liar Award. Look at what he said. The rest were still operating under the old covenant in Acts 1 and 8, 1 through 8. They were still dutifully keeping the law and still meeting as a Jewish body in Jerusalem. I'm going to infer that whoever wrote this sees only two things in their Bible. They get to the first page before Genesis and it says Old Testament. Well, that's when the old part starts. And then they finish Malachi, and they'll read the Bible through in a year, and they see the next page, New Testament. And that is all they see in the Bible. Old stuff, new stuff. Where we who actually read these Bible verses, now I've got questions, <laughs> forgot questions. When did the Old Testament start? <laughs> well, tell me Genesis 1.1. Exodus 19, anyone? Seven. Charlton Heston came down the mountain. That's when the first covenant was made. Exodus 19. Ah, it's a joke. Everybody's seen that movie, though. Well, what do you, the, the first time I taught that to anybody, they look at me and they're like, well, what do you call all the stuff before the Old Testament then? What do you call that? Mm, the stuff before the Old Testament? <laughs> Seems like a fine name to me. Now I've gotten more sophisticated. I call it the anti Old Testament period, meaning before, anti, A N T E. But the Old Testament was made with the house of Israel, the Old Covenant. That happened in Exodus 19. There was no house of Israel in Genesis 1-1.
Well, what about the New Testament? It starts in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. Hebrews 1 says you can't have a New Testament without the death of the testator. So the earliest it could start is the day Calvary happened. He makes a statement that says, I'll insert some words in it, these crazy unbiblical kooks think that Peter, James, and John and the rest were still keeping the law in Acts 1 through 8. Aren't those people dumb? Kind of the way I read it. Let's really read a couple of verses. Back in our subject, the book of Acts 2. Acts 2.46. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the First Baptist Methodist Presbyterian Church they just built. In the temple. Why were they in the temple? Didn't they know that the law is over with? All this Jewish stuff is done with? We're now the church, the body of Christ, where there's no such thing as Jew or Greek? Why were they in the temple? <gasps> were they keeping the law in the temple? And breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Flip over to the next page. Acts 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Again, at the temple. Why weren't they working on the design for their steeple, for the new church that they were going to build? Do you ever wonder why they put essentially a phallic symbol on top of church buildings to celebrate a celibate man? Why? It's a good question. Study it out. That was the first thing I, when we came here, I'm like, great, no steeple. But why aren't they out building their new denomination? Why are they doing all the old things that they had been doing? Going to the temple, celebrating Jewish feast days. Because the guys from God Question said all that stopped. But here we have Bible verses telling us that they are. Told you about Peter's conversation with the Lord in Acts 10. Or Peter doesn't want to listen to the Lord. No, 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 no. That, that would be. We're not doing that. Here's a question I have for the got question folks. I, if I'm a dummy for believing that Acts 2 is not the birthday of my church, there's a church. Operating in Acts 2. It's not my church. It's not the church, the body of Christ, that the Holy Ghost baptizes you into one body. You're saved and sealed and going to heavenly places according to a mystery God kept secret since the world began. It's not the prophetic stuff that God's been talking about since the world began. If I'm such a dummy for believing that, how come? And I think that New Testament Israel is always associated with the law. If that's dumb, then why does Acts 21 exist in God's Word. Is that a long enough question to ask? Maybe too long. Acts 21 They say we're wrong for believing that Peter, James, and John and all those folks were still following the law in Acts 1 through 8. Well guess what's after 8? 21. 21 is after 8, is it not? Okay. So let's read the words from God. We'll stop reading the words of the Got Questions guy and read God's words. And when, they, verse 17, when they were come to Jerusalem, 
The brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified unto the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother. What's he about to see? Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. And what are they doing? They all know that they're not under law, under grace. That's not what the verse says, does it? They are all zealous of the law. Who are the folks in charge of this church? Of thousands of people who are all zealous of the law. Peter, James, John, the rest of the twelve. So we're a long way into the book of Acts. So are Peter, James, and John just terrible apostles? All the way into Acts 21, they shouldn't have been associated with the law, but they still are. Did they just do a really terrible job? Did Jesus pick the worst guys on the planet? Or, that's one option, or they were doing exactly as they were instructed to by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you love me, Israel, keep my commandments. That's another option. But then, I'd, if I believed that, then I'd have to believe that Acts 2 wasn't the birthday of my church, and we're not going to do that. We'd have to change our whole manual for discipleship and everything. We'd have to reprint everything. If we believe that, just throw that troublemaker out. Everything will be fine. And we'll not look at Acts 21 and pay any attention to it. That's what we'll do here, the First Baptist Presbyterian Methodist. Episcopalian. That's the difference between you and me and the people who oppose you and me. When I came back, I spent a decade. I ain't going to church. Can't figure the Bible out, and all the preachers are a bunch of liars and little, little Hitlers, little Napoleons running their little fiefdom. I ain't going there. That was me. So when I came back and my friend talked me into studying the Bible out and told me, I found some answers. I figured some stuff out. When I came back, I said to myself, I will go wherever the Bible takes me. There's no sacred cow. There's no sacred doctrine. I'll go where it If it takes me to a dead end, I'll just go do what I've been doing. But I will follow God's words and see where that takes me. That takes me to believing that Acts 2 is not the birthday of my church for quite a few reasons. <laughs> and there's more. But wait, there's more. <gasps> Reality hits you hard, bro. Does anybody remember seeing that clip on YouTube? When you read the, ver the verses in God's Word, and you choose to believe them, and then you go read this statement by the Got Questions guy, you look at it, and he's bonehead. You're not mad at him, you're just, God's words tell me different. You're wrong, sir. Or you're wrong, madam, whoever wrote this. This is not true. I think that's enough for one day. I've reached the 45 minute mark.